Tonight we're very excited to have our CIP founder, Dr. Michael Spanman, join us as our keynote speaker, along with a distinguished panel of experts in the field who support young adults with learning differences. At this time, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Michael McManaman. For the past 40 years, Dr. McManaman has worked tireless, tirelessly to prepare young men and women for the skills for life, for college, for work, and for independent living. As a licensed clinical psychologist, he speaks nationally and internationally about topics related to helping young adults with learning differences achieve success. Dr. McManaman was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome at age 51 his personal struggle, struggles and ensuing victories and those of his students and staff have inspired his book, Made for Good Purpose. A guide to what every parent needs to know to help their adolescent with Asperger's High Functioning Autism, or LD, become a productive, independent adult. In addition to his book, he has also, he has also most recently finished an Autism and Learning Difference Toolkit titled Autism and Learning Differences, an Active Learning Teaching Toolkit which he will speak uh, to in his presentation this evening. The toolkit will also be available later on this month, and you can sign up for, uh, to order a copy if you haven't done so already this evening in the back. Please join me in, doc in welcoming Dr. Michael McMahon. Thanks a lot, Michael. I'm going to try to keep it nice and easy here. I'm going, to, I'm going to sort of set you guys up for these other guys who are going to fill in the details and try to uh, take the edge off for you. So, um, Being an Aspie, I had to give you something visual so you have this in your packet. This is my outline for my speech. I took it uh, from Mark Twain, who did visual note cards like this when he spoke. And um, so this is my little presentation in shorthand for you. If I look down, I'm going to set a timer here because I can be very verbose. Even though I was a very quiet little aspy boy, couldn't get a word out of me, I never asked a question in high school or college or anywhere. But now you can't shut me up, so I have to put that on to remind myself to stay within a, some kind of time limit. So, um, welcome aboard ship. And we've been you know, doing a lot of puns on ships for the last two days. And just, laughing, you know, about all of our puns, you know, so you'll notice on your uh, outline, the first one is made for good purpose. And I said, well, it could be made for good porpoise, you know, and so <laughs> trying to keep it play. And uh, so that's sort of our motto at CIP. You're made for good purpose and you're inherently valuable. You're not defective. You're not disabled. You're, uh, you weren't born, you know, uh, in defective. It's a learning difference, not a disease. Despite what our psychiatrist friends will tell you, we're not disordered. We just learn differently. We have a different learning profile than most people. Most people have an even profile like this, and ours is more like that. Very high highs, where we're very, very intelligent, and socially, for me, very low. I mean, I'm like, like, my kids are so smart. So much more socially smart than me even since they were teenagers, so they just went right by me. And so that's sort of embarrassing, but it, I understand it now. And so, uh, we, you know, if you're, um, your diagnosis, accepting your diagnosis is the most important. I was talking to Alex a little bit. He was going to speak to us about it before the presentation, how he could be a mentor for a lot of people out there because the fact that he really gets it about who he is and accepts it, and that sort of like moves the whole agenda. Sort of like when gay people stood up and said who they really were. It sort of made it clear that they're all over the place. There's kind of, everyone has them in their family. It's no big deal. You know, so for, um, for people on the spectrum, it's nice to see to have mentors. People that go before you who just stand up and say who they are and are proud of who they are. And they, they take their assets and they build them and they work on their little areas. I wouldn't even call them deficits, I would say areas where they need to pay attention to more. Like, I know that I'm not going to ask you anything about you. I'm going to talk right at you and tell you everything about me. And I have to concentrate on asking you, do you have you know, a wife? Or where were you born? Did you go to Long Beach State? I have, to, I have to do that constantly in my brain. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep talking to you and tell you everything about me, my farm, my playhouse, my art gallery, you know, travel, everything in the world. That's what you're going to hear. So, 
So um, diagnosis is really important part of it. If you don't accept, first you have to be aware of who you are. And so I started to wake up about 12 years ago. I thought, well, maybe I have some of this. Stephen Shore helped me a little bit. And you have to have understanding about what you have. Like, okay, this is the aspects of it I have, and this is what they are. And you have to accept it, truly accept it as being the way you were made for good purpose. That God made you that way. He didn't make junk. He made you that way on purpose, for good purpose. So then you, um, then you are able to self-disclose and and self-advocate. Then you reach the stage where I am, where I can self-determine. If I want to start a farm, I can go ask enough questions, get the resources, and figure it out because I'm willing to work with other people in unity with them. Right? So that's number one. And number two, there's a little pyramid there. Anyone have a guess about what it is? Uh, building blocks? No. Well, it, it's a good guess. And it's a, called the learning pyramid. And what it is is the active, uh, about active learning. It's so at the top of that pyramid is lecture, what I'm doing right now. That's about 5% effective in having other people learn. Okay, so if I use the bottom of it is 90%, and that's where you actually have peers teach peers. I was talking with the staff about this. If we have Alex teach another student something, or um, then that student's going to learn that 90% better than if I sit and lecture him about, you know, executive functioning. So the learning pyramid, the second one down from the top is like, you know, reading, and then there's a, I can't read without my glasses on, so I probably should do that. Uh, and then uh, audiovisual, then it goes down to discussion, and practice be right above, uh, you know, teaching others. So teaching others is the way we, work, we learn. So I said to the staff yesterday, we did a little training, and I said, you're, you're not, you don't, I don't want you teaching the students. I want you to teach them to teach each other. I want you to set up positive environments, um, facilitate, you're facilitators, and, and you facilitate them learning through each other. And that's so much more powerful. Teach them to be teachers, basically. So that's what that one stands for. Do you know what the next one stands for? SIS, Social Interpersonal Skills. And that is one of the most important things that we have to learn. Because that's the glue. No matter where you are in life, your relationship, your job, uh, your apartment building with your landlord, you have to know the social interpersonal skills. And those are usually the worst for people on the spectrum, right? That's our area of deficit, so that's the area we need to spend the most time in. I've learned eye contact and all these things over the last 13 years. Before that, people used to do this to me. They'd be looking behind them because they were wondering what I was looking at when I was talking to them. And I didn't even know that until I, someone told me. So I changed it. So what does that mean? Someone's got their cell phone on. Okay, uh, so those are really important. And that's the donkey there. What's the donkey stand for? If the students don't know this, then you better get you're in trouble right now. What is it? The flying Stanford kind of said the donkey is separated. Are you a student at CIP? Yeah. Okay. Oh my gosh. Who knows it? Come on, students. <laughs> no, it's not the Republicans. That's for sure. I'm telling you. God help me. But I'm sorry. But uh, <laughs> no, it's a donkey rule. So what's donkey rule? It's a social thinking rule. Basically, if five people call it a donkey, then it's probably donkey. So it's not a horse. Then if you think it's a horse and they think it's donkey. Don't be a jackass and do what they say. That's why CIP is here in Long Beach. Because I learned, I, 12 years ago, I learned how to learn from other people. Use your microcomputers to help me, your biocomputers. Put them all together and you had the answers I didn't have. I never asked questions before. I never used other people. So that's how it happened. And so that's why we're here now. Because I used the donkey rule. And the next one, PCP. You know this one? Yeah, I know this one. Okay, what is it? Ah. Got it? Person-centered plan. Person plan, right. So we do a person-centered planning process where you build a portfolio right from day one. Like, you don't have to wait till your kid is in college to do this. A little ASPE kid or anyone, or an AD kid, ADD kid. You 
build a portfolio of your work. And so who watched the movie Temple Grandin? Okay, my favorite part of the movie, if you know the movie, is when she's in front of the farm hands or the livestock managers or whatever they are, and she is such a goofy woman, believe me, I've had lunch with her and everything else. She's so socially out of it, even more than me. And she would never get a job going into an interview. She could never get a job because she's so goofy and so out of it. So how did she get the job? She brought her portfolio and shoved it in front of their faces with all her designs and her spirals of like beautiful pieces of art of the, the, uh, you know, the uh, animal harvesting, whatever they call it, uh, plants that, that are used all over the world now. And she showed them it, and then she gave them the facts, which we are, we're really good at, right? This prevents them from dying in the delousing pits because they're not scared. It's a kosher way of harvesting your animals. And she, she learned it by going in the pits herself, using the squeeze machine. And she learned that she was calmer after she came out of the squeeze machine, which is another sensory integration thing she learned. So all of this came out of her going and doing this at a farm, you know, at a cattle ranch. And so, uh, person-centered planning is a mechanism where we take students, they do a PowerPoint, they put the music on it, their pictures and everything, and they write their goals. Five year, three year, one year, six month goals in every area. Social thinking, executive functioning, sensory integration, academic, career, life skills. And then they present that to their family. And their family says, oh, I didn't know you want to be a tattoo artist. Or whatever. <laughs> you know, but uh, this happens. Okay, what's the next one? It says 8S4W. Anyone know? There are eight skills for work. And uh, it's from our book. And, uh, don't you? I don't have it memorized. Communication, teamwork, problem solving, initiative, leadership, planning, organizing, self-management, willingness to learn, technology. Now that is the, those are the eight most important things that anyone on the spectrum has to build transferable skills to the real workspace. That's what the employee is about, and that's what we're going to we're trying to do is build that in. It's useless for someone to be just studying academics at CIP because you can get a degree and still be totally un unable to hold a job or to have a relationship. So, and you can just be a smart guy who's a you know bag a bag person or whatever. Or on the street, so yeah, we have to do it all at once. Okay, the next one, what is that one? Anyone have a clue? It's called community integration. We talked about this the other day with the staff, too. Two things I talked about the most were the pyramid and community integration. Everything needs to be done outside the walls of CIP, not just inside the walls. Everyone sits in an office and just talks to you, they're not going to learn anything. They need to go to the computer company or to the supermarket and talk to the staff behind there and learn reciprocal conversation skills. They need to be out there practicing all these things in real life, otherwise it's not going to generalize, right? So I'll move on. UV, what's that? And it's just like little planets there. Universal values. Okay, so I'm, find, I'm finding now that people are starting to understand what we've been doing for a long time, which is great. It's coming back into the schools now, teaching really universal values. It's not teaching religion in schools. It's There's a general set of values we can all agree on no matter what religion you are, right? And this needs to be done. So you have to impart ethical values to people. It's, 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 it's necessary. And these are in two areas, performance values and relational values. So performance values would be things like being on time, you know, those kind of uh, relational values are learning how to talk to other people and problem solve and conflict, salute, resolution, things like that. So we have to be able to learn all of those too. Next one, we're going to move right along. PMP, what's that stand for? Who's got that? Residential coordinator? Probably never used those initials. Where is he? Okay. No, just took out. Took a hike. Oh, he's hiding back there. Okay, yeah, it's peer mediation pro, 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 uh, process. Conflict resolution. We have a little roommate meetings we have with students in their apartments to help them do that. That has to be integrated into every program 
in schools for these kind of kids learning how to problem solve and mediate you know, conflicts. Um, and number nine there, there's a book with a C on it and an I there. What would that stand for? Anyone have any idea? Gosh, we have a lot of guesses going on here. Curriculum integration. So this curriculum I'm talking about, you can integrate it two different ways. You can integrate it in a dedicated course, like at a college or at a high school or an elementary school or junior high. Or you could have it dispersed through, the, through integrated through your curriculum by learning, having all the teachers learn these concepts and teach it throughout your school. If you have a learning disability school, you could do it that way easier probably. And so number 10 there is a uh, A and E. What's that stand for? Anyone have a guess? It's not arts and whatever. It's not a TV program. It's uh, assessment and evaluation. And why do you have to use assessment? See, it's, this is where evaluation is screwed up. We evaluate teachers the wrong way. What, what I'm talking about here is qualitatively different. I'm talking about assessing students. So like, for example, let's say you were diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome. And what is it? It's, oh, well, I have some social difficulties. This, we ask students this, and they get, you get like one sentence usually. Or I have a couple of my processing problems. But they don't even know who they are. They don't even know if you had cancer, you'd sure know more about it, wouldn't you? This is not a disease. But they don't know who they are. So we use assessments in every area. Sensory integration assessment, um, uh, life, life, uh, life skills assessments, um, all of them that are in the book that we'll show you in a minute, are all, and some staff use some of them, and some of them don't at this point, but they're going to be using all of them. And so, let's put it that way. So if you don't know, for example, what kind of learning style you have, like I was talking to, again, to Alex, I don't want to but I said, what kind of learner are you? He said, I'm a combination of visual and verbal. Because I'm almost all visual. When I read Temple Grandin's book, Thinking in Pictures, I was forced to read it by my academic coordinator who came to my office and said, Michael, you've got to read this. And put up with all the cow stuff in it because it was boring as hell for the first 10 chapters. And when you get to the last two chapters, you'll see why I want you to read it. So I said, I'll read it. And I read it and was bored with all the cow stuff. And then I got to the end. And when she described her visual thinking skills, I didn't even know I was a visual thinker. I can go, I can take you back to Paris. I haven't been there for 10 years and show you around. I don't remember the names of the streets or anything, but I can show you where I ate. I can take you anywhere. I can take you to Jim Morrison's grave. I can probably know the subway stop and everything. And I didn't know, I thought everyone could do this. I didn't know it was a, my learning style was that strong. So you got to know what, who you are, right? And so you can tell your boss, this is how I learn best. Write it down for me and I'll do it. Okay. What's the next one there? It says, whatever. What does it say? Anyone know? Okay, it's people talking in their own words. And what that is refers to a chapter in the book, which is that we have students and staff telling all stories and how they got through transition. You know, when I go over a little bit. And uh, <laughs> I'll set my alarm off. But, <laughs> but I'm close. And anyway, so um, it's good telling their own stories. And what's the next one then? The next one is. The experts speak, and you notice I said blah, 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 blah. Because, as we said, lecturing is only 5% as effective as learning through doing and learning from peers. But they are peers of mine, and I would learn more from them than maybe you know, other people. So that's what that one stands for. Cancel that. And um, we're down to 12. And what that is is that there are... Um, <coughs> There are 12 chapters to the toolkit. And that's what these slides before you have been. I've touched a little bit on each of the 12 chapters of the book. What's the next one? It's a bad picture of a sombrero. And what that means is that we have toolkit trainings. And what we're doing is um, we take the book and we have three dedicated trainers who are going to be doing this training for this toolkit for professionals, parents, and psychologists, educators. 
And we have a couple of different formats. We have a three-day training here in December, which you're welcome to join at the Long Beach Center, which we're hoping to move to a new location right in the same building, a bigger space, hopefully. But uh, we'll see about that. And, uh, and then we have them in Mexico in March and in July and in December at an amazing training center, beautiful spot in near Lake Chapala, about half hour below Guadalajara. And that's a leisure and learn program where you come with your spouse or a friend, you, you learn from nine, eight in the morning to about two, then you go on a tour of historic Guadalajara if you want, or you go horseback riding, or you go to a volcano, or you do whatever you want. Go on an art tour of the city or whatever. So there's, it's a really beautiful spot and it's all inclusive. And uh, it's really a nice way to learn about your son or daughter or about the field in general. If you want to, and then the last day of that training, which is really cool, is that you have individual consults with either myself or uh, our other two trainers who are uh, really a, you know been in the field a while too. And so that that's what we've developed, and we're doing that all over the country um, over the next couple of years. Uh, and then what is the next one? CIP. But what does it stand for besides college internship program? Who can guess this one? Constantly in progress, and that was coming from a student who now is an employee at the Bavard Center, and he came up with that himself. And I thought that's really wonderful. And if you heard his story, well, you can see it online if you want. It's really, it's pretty awesome, really. So the last one is think positive, and I want to tell you how the little stones that we give out, how that's a little brief, brief story about the stone. So when I was opening the center in Berkeley. I um, was walking down the street, and I was doing it by myself. I had a rental car and my cell phone, and just trying to figure out where the building would be, how I would get phone system, uh, staff, you know, and everything, you know. And I'm just wandering around the city, and I was getting very frustrated. I said to myself, Michael, you need to think positive. And I look over, I think Berkeley is the weirdest place on the planet. Besides, there's a couple places weird, but no, I don't know. And on the windowsill of the store, there was a little stone that said, think positive on it. And I picked up the stone, like, like the ones I have here, and I put it in my hand. And I said, wow, that's cool. And I put it in my pocket. And it was a sensory device for me. So I kept feeling it. And it reminded me constantly for the next three days to think positive. And so what I did is I went and bought stones. And I made them, and I put one back on the windowsill to repay. And I put them in public bathrooms and started giving them to people for the last 10 years all over the world. And what happens is that, um, I'll give you an example. I went to a conference in Nice, France, with a friend from England, just from a school in England. And we get there, and he was like, you know, poo-pooing my stones, saying, oh, this is so stupid, I'm not going to get these stones out. And so I said, oh, yeah, well, OK. And so we get to the conference in France. And within 10 minutes, a headmaster from a school in Norway comes up to me and says, Michael, still have your heads, you know, you're still in my backpack. And then I sit down and we'll go in the room for the training and a woman from school in uh, Luxembourg or whatever, you know, international school said, Michael, I have your stone in my purse. Or another one, and three of them within 15 minutes come up to me and say, I still have your stone. And, and they say, I love your stone, I put it on my desk, or I gave it to my partner who has cancer, put it by the sink, and all these good things happen. But the stones, here's the problem, and I'll shut up after this, I promise. I got the stones from a church lawn in Florida. They had white stones all over. These, these stones are from Florida. And I kept taking bags of stones from there. You know, there's millions of stones there. And I felt guilty about it because I'm Catholic, you know. And I was, and I'm supposed to. And uh, so I put the, uh, I went finally after several years, and I said, I got to do something about this. So I found where the stones come from, like at a stone company. And I said, can I sit in your stone pile and pick out the stones I want? I sat there and got burned, you know, picked the stones out. And then I got two extra really big bags, and I put them like Martin Luther did on the church door. I put them right in front of the church door, and I put a note on there, and I explained to them how I had repurposed their stones, all the, and all the good things that had come out of their stones. And so that's the story of the stones. So, Anyway, and then my son, being the itinerant marketer that he is, made them into little stickers. 
so you can bring them and stick them all over the world. Anyway, I'm thankful to be here. I'm looking forward to hearing all the great stuff from these panelists, and we'll all talk to you afterwards. Thanks for having me.